Working on audio, whether it's smart audio or dumb audio, is one of the most difficult challenges known to an electrical engineer. And Espressif recently introduced this Lyra T-board, which is now available in multiple versions. And as I recently used the Lyra T 4.3 for one of my customers, I wanted to talk a little bit about what it does well, what it does not so well, and also wanted to show you how to get started with it. And this is the actual board which you get when you buy the thing, for example, like I did from TME, but it's also commonly available from various other distributors. Here on top, we see the normal ESP32 unit, and here we see the codec and the two microphones, in addition to the standard jacks for connecting more custom audio hardware. And what's important is you see we've got two micro USB jacks over there and you need to use both of them. The one supplies the power, the other one is responsible for communicating via the USB serial chip here, which we're going to look at later. And for you as a person who wants to experiment with it, this is important, the power switch, because this ESP32 can be switched on and off independently of the charging circuit, which always has one LED lit up. And then over there we've got the boot and reset buttons, which we will need later for mode control. And finally, we've got a few very limited expansion headers. This is very important because if you are looking to access a lot of GPIB, uh, of GPIO pins and this kind of stuff for custom hardware, then this is the wrong board. Because as you see here, you've got I2C, you've got UART, you've got JTAG, and finally here, you've got the I2S. And this essentially is it. The rest of these plugs are all mainly for the relatively advanced audio system. And now it's time for the actual software setup. We will be using the ESP IDF here, which is their real C development framework. And it also comes with a gaggle of compilers and other stuff, which however will come onto our machine as a pre-compiled binary. Then here, one level above it, we have the ESP RDF, which stands for Audio Development Framework and which provides a wide variety of comfortable to use audio pipeline and similar infrastructure. Keep in mind that the RDF also contains its own version of the IDF. Why this is important, we'll look at later. And then finally, on top of all of this enchilada, we will have your user code and various other libraries, which are part of the ESP32 ecosystem. And yes, I want to explicitly mention once again, ESP DSP, because that is an incredibly helpful collection of all kinds of digital signal processing routines, which have really helped out me and my client on our project. So this is an Ubuntu 18.04 workstation and I will start out by creating a new working folder. I'm calling it ASPYT here for YouTube, but normally you will just call it ASP as you see here but I've got a variety of ASP folders and as long as the names are short it shouldn't be a problem. The first act involves downloading the IDF framework. This with the minus B is very, very important because as you can see here on the website of the ADF, you need to get a corresponding version of IDF. So either way, we hit return here and then we wait for the download, which always takes a bit of time. In the meantime, we need to visit this URL where you see here tool chain setup and then you can download an archive containing the pre-compiled compiler and all this stuff. You just click it, you download it and I assume that you will dump it in your downloads folder. As you see here, this download process is recursive. 
So don't wonder, it takes a little bit of time, especially if your internet connection isn't excessively fast. So as you see here, we get this. So now we know we are done. And now we need to enter this just to unpack the whole enchilada. And now if we push this, you see here the IDF and here the pre-done compilers. The next step involves changing into the IDF folder to download some Python requirements. Because part of the IDF toolchain works on Python, and so you see we need to do this command to parse the requirements.txt. And you see here it pitches around a lot because on my machine almost all of the things are already there. Either way, at this point we go up one level and we just repeat the game to download the ADF as well. And as you see here, we are downloading another copy of the IDF development environment. So this is something which you have to keep in mind later. For now, we just wait for the download to complete. And we see here, we get another confirmation. So now we clear the screen and we start connecting the thing. We connect first the power connection, switch it on. At this point, some lights go on. Then we connect the UART and then we once again check whether the power switch is set to on or to off. If it's not set to on, the next step will not work. And then we punch in the mask. And we see here, we get all the reports and you see I didn't enable the second USB cable yet. So now I enable it. And now you see here this declaration, which informs us that the ASP32 is located at this address. So it's gonna be slash dev slash TTY USB, if I could only type zero. This we need to remember. And we punch in ls for one last time and we see the workspace is ready. When you work with the ASP32 command line tools, you always need to set up a few variables. First of all, we need to modify the path like this. because we want to make the various binaries available from the path. And then in the next step, we must declare either ADF path or IDF path. So either we run this one or we run this one. And this is important because an ADF project obviously requires this path to be declared. And if you in mistakenly also have the other variable declared, you get all kinds of weird problems during compilation. So, but as we want to start with the IDF, we need to run this command first. And this is now valid in this terminal window. So if you close the terminal window and open another one, you have to start all over again. And now in the next step, we need to get ourselves a project skeleton because the ASP32 toolchain uses a relatively complex system of make files and other things. But as you see here, we now have a new folder called hello world and in there we have the make file and we can go to main and we even have here 
the little program example, which will be used soon. Now, the most important thing is we go back to the project's root directory and then we enter make menu config. And this now starts a small compile process and then we get this configuration system through which you navigate with the cursor keys just as if you were compiling a Linux kernel. And the most important thing is here in serial flasher config where you need to check that we've got the right port. Then we go out with exit, we go for save, ok, exit. And now we've created the compilation configuration. It's basically a configuration file which the IDF environment will then take and will use to judge over the working environment. And now we can basically run make flash and deploy it. But in practice often you will get an error. Particularly you will get an error which says that the pure parsing version is not correct. And in this case, you need in the first place to uninstall the system's pure parsing environment like this. And then you reinstall the outdated one from the Ubuntu package repositories. And now, because I already did this before, we go for make flash. And we see this compile process takes a little bit of time. You can pass in minus J if you want to accelerate it, but we don't want to, we've got time. And here, as you see here, if you don't pass in minus J, you don't get much in terms of parallelization. Here, most of the CPU drain, which we are seeing, is caused by my simple screen recorder application which quite incidentally is a very, very good program if you ever need to record something on the Linux workstation. And now we see something cool. We see it's trying to connect and it will fail. And the reason why it fails is that our Lura T board currently is in run mode and not in bootloader mode. I'm going to let it fail so that you see the problem. You see here, timed out waiting for packet header. So now we run it again. And the moment I see connecting, I push and hold boot. I push and release reset. And now I also release the boot button. So once again, you push boot, hold it pressed, shortly tap reset and release it. And then when this is done, you see it shows up. And now we go make monitor. And now it's connected and now we push reset once again and then we see all of the status information from the program on hand. And for exiting it we push control and the closing bracket symbol as it showed up in the startup. And at this point we are ready to start experimenting with the ADF. And you see here in this folder there is a large variety of pretty great examples. So first things first we are going to try and just add the missing variable and then we can get ourselves another example project like that. Actually I got this one wrong but now it's correct. And now we get ourselves the example project. And now we see here it did it and we bring it in, we change into it and now we do another make menu config run because we need a compilation settings. And now we see here, among other things, the audio HAL folder. This is very important because the ASP RDF allows you to provide a variety of audio utilities. And you see here, we have this, it's set up correctly. So we go back, we check this, 
it's also set up correctly and we must once again save and create the configuration. And now we try once again make flash. And we'll pass in minus J8 to accelerate the process even though this sometimes makes the error mistakes less clear. But as you see now all the eight cores of my workstation are at work. And we see it didn't quite turn out as we expected it. So now we give another make flash run, but with only one thread at a time. And we see here these kind of errors. These errors always, always, always are bullshit. They occur if we have both IDF and ADF path variables declared. And to prove this, I'm now opening a new terminal. Zooming in a little bit, it's always a bit of a trouble. Go back into the working directory and now I only declare the path and then I declare the ADF path. And now I do make flash again. And we still get the error, so now we try make clean and another make flash. And we see here it's gonna ask us because a lot of things have changed. So yes, we can just hit enter here for a few times and then we see it's working. Alternatively, we could or rather we should have also run once again make menu config because the make menu config would create a different configuration file when it's using the ADF alone. And now you see it's trying to connect itself again. So boot, reset, release, reset, release, boot. And we see we were also able to run an ADF based project on our little microcontroller. And yeah, I have to apologize, but this is my OCD kicking in. Here you see a picture of the audio pipeline, which is implemented in the ADF framework. And as you see here, basically, you've got these individual pipeline particles and you can insert additional particles into the pipeline. But this is also a topic for another day. At this point, congratulations, your Lyra T should be able to run some kind of software which you write for it or which you take from the samples. Now, of course, the big benefit is that we have a working hardware platform and now you can use a variety of elements from the ESP32 ecosystem. So with this, I'm going to say bye bye for today, but stay tuned because I might make another video on some more advanced applications in the near future. Thank you very much.